Welcome back to Trashy Divorces, everyone. My name is Stacy. I'm Alicia. And this week, we're going over the rainbow. Or under the rainbow. Maybe we're crashing into the rainbow. Crashing into the rainbow. Stacy, this week you have an oft-requested Trashy Divorce. Do we get this a lot and we've avoided doing it because there's just not actually... They've been they've both been very private about it, but this is the very short marriage between Renee Zellweger and Kenny Chesney, which has spawned much speculation, fairly or unfairly, and uh, we get into it. I'm going to pull a weeping angel and say, don't blink, because if you blink, you're going to miss how quick that marriage and fallout Serious, was. you're not kidding. <laughs> you are not kidding. And you have another all-star. I do. I know last week we talked about seven being the magic number, but sometimes they're just Sometimes they're filled with so much tragedy. You can be an overachiever with lower numbers. Oh, God. Judy Garland, y'all. Five marriages, four divorces. It is a story full of tragedy. This week, Over the Rainbow. It's a classic ballad composed by Harold Arlen with lyrics by Yip Harburg. That's not a real name. (laughs) Yip Harburg is totally a real name. The song was written and used iconically in the 1939 movie Great the Wizard of Oz. Pretty sure it won an Academy Award for Best Original Song in a movie. It will also become Judy's signature song. Rightly so. As well as the title for this Trashy Divorces episode. Which is obviously at the high watermark for the song. For sure. Frank Sinatra will also cover the song. It also is the reason I cried at the end of my story. I haven't cried in so long. You've been very, uh, it's been it's been a dry phase. <laughs> it really has been a dry phase until today. I waited until the very end, though, like the last 30 seconds. You really did. Uh, as we're super glad you're here with us, audience. We are. Welcome we are. to Trashy Divorces. And as a quick heads up, we are going to bring some of our older Patreon content out from behind the paywall. In case you are one of the millions of people who are suddenly working from home or unexpectedly staying home for childcare or whatever, because these are exciting times we're living in, we're going to have a link for you on Tuesday's St. Patrick's Day bonus episode. What? There's a St. Patrick's Day bonus episode? What? 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 The Shamrock Cannon is coming out? It ain't easy being green. To fire clovers far and wide. So anyway, be sure to subscribe to our little show here uh, if you are not already subscribed, and that way you'll be sure to get the details on oh, Tuesday. Oh, they're going to be good. When they drop. Um, so mostly we we get, we also, our area schools are closed and blah, blah, blah. Like these yeah, are, we're hearing from a lot of our listeners. Mm-hmm. They've got a little bit of extra time in their mm-hmm. world. Yeah. Uh, so if we can provide you with additional options for distraction, we are happy to do so. Wash your hands. And we're all in this together. We can't do much, but we're trying to help. Mm -hmm. So stay tuned for that. It's going to be, no, it's going to be an exciting week. I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be fun. But speaking of Patreon. Patreon, y'all. We are so grateful, Stacy, me and you, Mm -hmm. collectively. (laughs) So grateful for the folks that have joined us over there. This week, y'all, we've had all kinds of fun with a follow-up from last week's episode Oh, right. Yeah. I did a deep dive into the song Dear Prudence, Mm -hmm. as well as the White Album and all the trash candy. Ooh, there was a trashy divorce of the Frank Sinatra, John Kennedy, Peter Lawford love triangle that all came to a bad, bad end in 1962. Sure did. And then then you brought diseases. (laughs) Look, honey, I brought diseases. We did on Trashy Tutors this week talk about the sweating sickness. It mystery. seemed to be a good time to cover it. Yeah, it's a really cool medical mystery story that uh, I enjoyed that a lot. So. so we have some amazing, all of our existing Patreon folks, thank you. We have some new shout outs to give. We do. For big thanks and praise to who's in our magic mirror this week. This week in the magic mirror. Thank you to Amy M, Alana M, Caitlin M. Are you guys all related? Laura. <laughs> Kate M. There were a lot of M's this week. I'm going on the non-M track. Okay. Beth R. Kate S. Trisha with a S-H. Trisha <laughs> I-B with a C-I. Mm-hmm. Megan Laura. Eliza K. Thank you all. We are so happy to see you in our magic mirror. Thanks for joining our Patreon community, the best community that exists in the world. It's true. Um, are you are you ready now to launch our trash candy machine over the rainbow? I mean, 
Birds fly over the rainbow. Why, oh why, can't I? Go, go, go. Let's do it. Stacey, our listeners have often requested your divorce profile this week, and I feel like this week was a really good way to segue into that skid. Yeah, and we've avoided covering this one because there's so little... It's a mystery. It's a mystery. Mm, but it sure does tie into Judy Garland week here at the podcast because I have the brief... Super brief... And mysterious, super mysterious courtship, marriage, and annulment of actress Renee Zellweger, who just picked up an Academy Award for Best Actress for playing Judy Garland in Judy, to country music king Kenny Chesney. I cannot wait to hear about this story. Friends, buckle into your time machines. Oh. We will go all the way back to 2005. This whole thing played out in 2005. They met, they began dating, they married, they annulled. Done. Boom. Within a year? Within, uh, it's a May to September romance. Wow. They married in May and ended in September. That's brief. Mm, brief. It's quick. It's quick. You just snappity doo da. That's how you do it. All right. A bit about our sweet Renee Zellweger, who was born April 25, 1969. She's a Taurus. In Katy, Texas. She's a first-generation American with a Swiss dad who got to Texas for the oil business and a Norwegian mom who came to Texas as a governess for a Norwegian family. Really? Really. Very strange. Young Renee got the acting bug while she was studying journalism at UT Austin, and she earned her Screen Actors Guild card doing a Coors Light commercial. (laughs) That is fantastic. From Humble Origins. First Big Break, 1994, reboot, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Next Generation, which to me, I'm like, oh, is that Star Trek with Leatherface? Is that what's (laughs) happening here? (laughs) Oh, Stacey. (laughs) (laughs) It wasn't much of a film, I guess, but uh, Renee did get a very nice review. Quote, the most formidable screen queen since Jamie Lee Curtis went legit, said one reviewer. Wow, that's Mm -hmm. quite a high... High compliment. It's not bad for a movie that very few people saw. Jerry Maguire, where she starred opposite Tom Cruise, is probably her big breakout role. She was the love interest of Tom Cruise. And we do spend quite a bit of time shitting on little Tommy Boy on this podcast. So let's note that it was he who selected her for the role. And he said that she was responsible for, quote, revealing the core humanity of the movie. So... Well, we can. There's one nice thing Tom Cruise yep. has done. There you go. Way to go, Tom. There you go. We finally have a halo for Tom Cruise. I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> but that wasn't shitty. Good job, Tom. Okay. Not a bad review. So, pretty sure that we can agree that the iconic Renee Zellweger film is Bridget Jones's Diary, 2001. We watched it last night. We did high, high five, five in boom. quarantine. It was TV. It was just genuinely funny. I mean, I, I saw it back in the day. I'm pretty sure I read the book, too. And, like, it's just a funny movie. See, Bridget Jones' Diary, for me, is one of the movies that no matter where it is in the cycle of the movie, if it's on, I'll sit down and watch it. I was surprised to, like, that you were quoting lines as oh, before they were said. It's was... like Goonies. It's like My Cousin Vinny. It's in that. Like, I have just a few. Like, wherever it is, I'm going to sit down and watch it. It's She's charming. She's charming. Yeah. However, the casting decision there raised a lot of eyebrows because uh, Bridget Jones, it's a character- Not English. From, yeah, the Helen Fielding novel. Bridget Jones is British. She is pleasantly plump, let's say. And she is a hearty smoker. So, you know- Renee Zellweger, none of those things. None of those things, but (laughs) she would not be deterred. So she put on 20 pounds. She got dialect coaching to nail that English accent, which actually she- did quite well to she my did pretty well, yeah. American ear and took up. Do you remember when herbal cigarettes were a thing? Oh my God. Back in the day. That's, she wasn't I just smoking smelled tobacco. them. I just uh-huh. smelled mm-hmm. them. I haven't thought oh about God. herbal cigarettes in a long time. What nightmare. Wow. What nightmare products. And they would sell them at health food stores, sure. which is even weirder. Okay. Whatever. 
two thousand. It was a different time Boom. in two thousand one. Oh, so so different. Also, she spent three weeks like interning at Picador Publishing in London to get a feel for what it was like to work in that office environment. Well, she needed to meet Mister Tits Pervert. She was nominated for an Academy Award for the performance, and then again in O two for her role in Chicago. Oh, she was amazing mm-hmm. as Roxy Hart in Chicago. Yep, she would not win an Academy Award until 2004, and that was for Best Supporting Actress in Cold Mountain, which was another really cool movie. That, oh, yeah, I forgot uh-huh. about that. Yeah, that, that's also now on my list to rewatch with Nicole Kidman. And Anyway. Okay, so that gets us to 2004. She's genuinely a movie star, famous, award-winning, respected, beloved. On She's top of the world. Renee Zellweger. Get happy. We're going to park her at the trashy divorces depot okay and we're gonna head over and check out her very brief paramour fiance husband former husband kenny chesney in my imagination the trashy divorces depot smells like herbal cigarettes now <laughs> we're, sorry to everyone <laughs> we put her there, there for very long okay yeah let's, <laughs> gotta move on this now Whew. <laughs> kenny chesney hails from outer knoxville tennessee he was born march 26th 68 so he's an aries so that's aries taurus mix oh my Oh, my. He received a guitar for Christmas when he was a teenager, and that was that. When he was in college, he recorded a demo that sold a 1,000 copies, bought himself a better guitar. Fantastic. Graduates from East Tennessee State University and heads to Nashville because he knows what he wants out of life. That's the dream. Early on, he was described as working in a neo-traditional country sound with like a, I don't know, identifiably Tennessee twang, which, is that a thing? Anyway, I guess it's a thing. I'm sorry, go back. A neo what? A neo traditional country sound. That's an awful lot of words. So for plucking a guitar. It's yeah. and mm-hmm. singing. So uh yeah, over the years he'd shift into a more modern country pop style, which is actually when he saw his greatest success. The his his rootsier stuff, I guess, launched him, but it did not sustain the it did not cowboy within. You've got a you got to catch the gravity well to actually arc around the moon. It just wasn't quite, you know what, I'm just going to keep reading what I wrote. All right, Faraday. You're Ken- getting a little far out there. Kenny started landing songs on the Billboard Hot Country charts with his debut in 94. And for the next five years, he was releasing increasingly well-received albums every year or so. 1994, has he been around that long? Yeah. <gasps> yeah. I had no idea. He was precocious, though. Like, he really did. He finished college and was just like, I'm out. Bye. I'm going to go write songs in Nashville. And that's what he did. I had no idea his career Mm -hmm. had been that long standing. Well, it's because you weren't following neo-traditional country music at the time, Alicia. I was listening to Grateful Dead, which is country music for people who say they don't like country music. Well, he's a big Jimmy Buffett fan. so He does a lot with Jimmy. Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me if uh, he also was a a dead fan. Like he sounds like he's a guy who loves uh, happy... Get Ah, happy. Okay, let's go, Kenny. Okay. So he lands She's Got It All on the number one spot in 97 and got That's Why I'm Here to the number two spot in 98. His next album was 99's Everywhere We Go. That had two consecutive number one hits, How Forever Feels and You Had Me From Hello. And I mentioned that one because that's a line from Jerry Maguire. Oh, Mm. is it about our sweet Renee? I don't. Thinks, I think it's just inspired by. Okay. Mm, but yes, these two had a crush on each other before they met. Oh, okay. it's like Halle Berry and Dave Justice. A little bit. Oh, that's kind of cute. A little bit. Everyone hates you. Let's get married. <laughs> I'm going to marry that boy. <laughs> <laughs> no, no one hates either of these people. In the 2000s, he really cranked things up professionally. The song The Good Stuff spent seven weeks at number one in 02. Oh, is that him? Became I love that song. It's a good song. Country song of the year. Yeah. Oh. I, yeah. I know that. I know that one. Video for the single Young from No Shoes, No Shirt, No Problem. Was oh, I know that album. song. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. This one, Male Video of the Year at the Country Music, CMT, Country Music Television. Yeah. Country Music Turnaround. No, Country Music Television. No, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm, in, I'm okay. in the scene enough to know where you're going. This is great. ACM honored him as Top Male Vocalist of the Year. 04, he released When the Sun Goes Down, whose first uh-huh. single... There Goes My Life stayed at number one for seven weeks. The album and singles won a ton of awards, including Album of the Year, and made Kenny Entertainer of the Year. Everything's going great, right? 
It's awesome. It's awesome. Okay, so December 2004, less awesome. A massive earthquake struck in the Indian Ocean, spawning a just nightmare tsunami. The devastated coastal areas in Indonesia, India, Sri Lanka, and Thailand. This thing killed 230,000 people. Holy smokes. 1.7 million were made homeless. Mm. So, I don't know. It's like you were either alive and remember that or you weren't. And it was it was terrible. I remember that. It was terrible. I remember spending time on that in therapy back then. It was terrible. When terrible things happen, what what happens? In Stars the throw a benefit. Celebrities assemble like a very talented Avengers, <laughs> <laughs> which is what happened. <laughs> so oh my. NBC threw a tsunami relief concert of Hope Telethon in uh, January that Kenny Chesney and Renee Zellweger were both part of. Oh, well, that's nice. She was a big movie star. He was a big music star. These were off to the races. So gossip site NikkiSwift.com describes how they how they hooked up. According to an unnamed source, Zellweger and Chesney met in January of five yet yeah, the whatever. Zellweger's friends said the Oscar winning actress had hoped to meet Chesney and planned to pass him a note during the event. Before oh my she God. could, the actor <sighs> and singer's publicists began talking about Zellweger's intentions. When the broadcast wrapped, Chesney went over to Zellweger and said I hear you're trying to pass me a note. Don't let the principal find out. I'm just guessing about the accent. <laughs> I hear you're trying to pass me a note. Don't let the principal find out. <laughs> it's probably an okay line. That would have worked on me. It worked on Renee. I, yeah. That worked on Renee. I will say, Kenny Chesney is very cute, too. Oh, he's like, cute. Mm-hmm. And he's charming. Yeah. So on May 9th, 05. That these, quick. They've January known each other May. five months. <sighs> <sighs> They flew to St. John in the Virgin Islands. They got married in a very private ceremony. 35 friends and relatives in attendance. There are photos. They look super happy. This sounds lovely. Oozing of marital bliss. And herbal cigarettes. I'm Let's, kidding. <laughs> Lots of linen, though. It Really, they, they looked great. Yeah. No, there were lovely pictures. Mm-hmm. I remember them being on, like, the cover stories of the mags. Yeah. Yeah. Big Renee deal. and Kenny. Yeah. Big day. Obviously. What happens next? After just four months, Renee filed to annul the marriage. Oh. And this is where things got and have remained very tricky for Kenny Chesney. Four months. Mm -hmm. So annulment is different from divorce because when you annul a marriage, the court basically voids it. It's as though it never happened. It never existed. Erased. It's erased. Okay. Commonly... Annulment is used, uh, let's say you marry someone and then you realize that like some some form on that person's divorce years before hadn't been properly filled out, that kind of thing. Ah, okay. So you would then annul that marriage. They would finish the divorce. So to annul a marriage, you have to choose a reason. There's there's no such thing as a no-fault annulment. You can do no-fault divorce, but in annulment, there's some kind of fault. So... These, again, it can be bigamy abuse. Uh, so there one, are boxes you can check. <clears throat> one on of the, the parties form. is too young. Yeah, if you guys were both drunk, you oh. can annul. I'm sure there's I a have... time frame on that, but. Only Ross and Rachel would use that. There's also a catch all concept of fraud, hmm. Hmm. which can mean anything from that being drunk at the time of the wedding. If, like, if I got you drunk and then. We got married. You could be like, you defrauded me. You got me drunk. Totally filing for that annulment tomorrow because that's what happened. I mean, the, <laughs> from the pictures, it didn't look like they were drunk on the beach on St. John. They really, whatever. So broad is the broadest check this it's category. It's okay. a... None of the other things cover what happened, so we're calling it broad. Yeah, like okay. it, it doesn't seem like there was any violence in the home. It doesn't seem like... They both, it sounds like they're both workaholics, but it doesn't sound like either of them is like, you know, addicted to a substance or anything like that that might. Any of the other profiles we've covered on trashy divorces. (laughs) Inveterate cheater. (laughs) Like, well, we could come up with a whole new set of of divorce grounds that would be amazing. Okay. Checkbox. 
limit yourself to three. So because fraud sort of can mean whatever in in their minds as they're filling out this form, they're like, well, I guess, I mean, that that's the one that makes the most sense of the options we have before us. And so, of course, when the press learned that fraud was the reason that the marriage had ended, uh, it prompted a cavalcade of speculation that Kenny Chesney is gay. And, I mean, again, this was 05, so we're 15 years on now. That speculation is still Tons out there. Tons of wagon, mm-hmm. yeah. So, and, I mean, if it's not the case, Kenny Chesney definitely says that he is not gay. And, and if that is the case, it's it's unfortunate. <laughs> like, this is just an unfortunate thing that he's just going to have to deal with for the rest of his life. And sorry. Okay, so Renee has said... Quote, the term fraud as listed in the documentation is simply legal language and not a reflection of Kenny's character. I would personally be very grateful for your support in refraining from drawing derogatory, hurtful, sensationalized, or untrue conclusions, and greatly appreciate your understanding that we hope to experience this transition as privately as possible. Well, that's a stand-up comment. Mm-hmm. Then, because that did not bat it down, they had oh, to issue no. a joint statement. <sighs> Quote, the miscommunication of the objective of their marriage at the start is the only reason for this annulment. Renee and Kenny value and respect each other and are saddened that their different objectives prevent the success of this marriage. I will Leave note, it alone already, people. Well, I will note that out. I'll note that neither of them have gone, neither has remarried, neither has had children. Because when I see we have different objectives, I think, oh, maybe one of them wanted kids, the other didn't. Right. That would be... But nothing has really happened in the in the years since to... Interesting. It's interesting. Hmm. Okay. In 2009, Kenny was interviewed by Playboy, and he said, quote, In order for us to get an annulment, the legal papers could claim either physical abuse, which wasn't true, or three or four other things that also weren't true. The best thing we could put in there was fraud. So I said, all right, do it. Whatever. Not knowing that it would create the scuttlebutt. For the rest of his life. Mm. Mm -hmm. My favorite was when Anderson Cooper, who at the time was not publicly out as a gay man, interviewed him in 2007 about these gay rumors. Oh, my. Somehow, like, we'll have this clip on TrashyDivorces.com because there there is something about, like, the theater of what media presents to us versus the fact of you basically you have a closeted gay man interviewing a guy who's repeatedly been... Accused of being a closeted Accused gay man. Accused of being, yeah, mm-hmm. or like there's speculation that he's, it's it's just very strange, especially in light of Anderson Cooper now being very out. So there you go. In 06, the annulment was granted. The marriage was voided. Neither is married again. Both have gone on with their successful careers. Renee took about six years off after 2010, but she's come back in a very big way. It's possible that Kenny wishes she had stayed out of the spotlight, though, because when she sat down to do publicity for Judy, oh my, people brought up like, what was it like playing somebody who married gay men throughout? <laughs> like, so did Liza Minnelli, her daughter. Like, what was that like? And just no one in the world thought, oh, how would she know? <laughs> I, I'm i sorry, Kenny Chesney, either for you having to deal with this unfairly or you living a life that you can't be open about. Like, it's really shitty. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. a little shitty. However this is, it, whatever it, way it really it, sucks. Yeah. Very, very sorry. So, you know, we do not have any news on this. We, nope. <laughs> um, I feel like both of them do a lot of talking around what happened. Like Kenny says that he panicked or that he felt like he was losing his identity or that being married wasn't something he could fit into a neat box in his life. He's apparently a big compartmentalizer. And Renee consistently expresses sadness that people are so mean about the gay thing, which is like not actually responsive to the questions being raised. It's just, it's just interesting. So we're going to move on to your actual Judy Garland story, but uh, for... For the fictional portrayal of Judy, um, this gets no trash cans because the trash cans mysteriously disappeared and no one in touch with the trash cans will tell us why. What happened? Where'd they go? uh, (laughs) They were were here. Were there trash cans here? (laughs) I swear they're, they're okay. They're just gone. 
Well, sometimes listeners really want to hear about a particular divorce and we go into researching that divorce and we're like, in this case, there's not a, there's not a whole lot there that's verifiable. Yeah. We held off on this one because I was like, I have no idea what happened there. Sometimes the story is just so sad. Uh, Paul McCartney and Heather Mills. Like sometimes the story is just super sad and we're like, we're a comedy podcast. But, uh, wow, that was more than I ever knew about the mystery of that romance. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it's not a mystery. Like they, they weren't meant for each other. Clearly it took them check fraud box. Had they not gotten married in May, it would not have been noteworthy that they broke up in September. Right. right. It would have like, passed like, oh, didn't they used to date? Yeah. Yeah. Like. Yeah, I mean, famous people date all the time and break up, and it's just the marriage that made it weird. Don't make it weird, people. Just don't get married at five months. The heart wants what the heart wants, (laughs) and so does the bladder. Are you ready to take a break? (laughs) Yeah, let's uh, cue some music or whatever. We'll be back with all Judy all the time after this word from our sponsor. (laughs) Stacey, I regret to inform you that I will be taking time for my self-care at 11 o'clock on Monday. Guess what's happening? Did you follow up with your BetterHelp counselor? I did. (sighs) The thing with BetterHelp, you do this easy survey. It matches you with a great counselor. And if that counselor isn't the one for you, you can change at no cost. I luckily have found my perfect therapist. I love her so much. Mm -hmm. So wherever you are, which could mean that you're under quarantine or something, BetterHelp can connect you with a professional counselor online. You can chat via secure video or telephone. You can chat and text with your therapist. And once you sign up with BetterHelp, you can start communicating with your therapist in under 24 hours on your desktop, mobile web, Android, and iOS apps. It's perfect for self-isolation. Here's the thing. Mental health is a big deal. Like, I know we talk about, let's take care of our bodies, but taking care of our minds is just as important. And whatever you're working through, whether it is a... Do you think it could be anxiety in 2020? Do you think... Major trauma. Maybe or anxiety. The anxiety of 2020. I guarantee BetterHelp has counselors who can help you. Family conflict, stress, anxiety, uh, depression, overcoming trauma. Maybe you need to work through something. Maybe you just want a little check-in on how your mental health is doing. Your better help counselor is there. Yeah. So if you put taking better care of yourself on your 2020 goal list and then 2020 actually started happening, <laughs> we are very happy to be able to give you a little a little break on we accessing. We love a discount. We love a we discount. We love a coupon, as we say in the South. So you can get 10% off your first month of BetterHelp by visiting our special URL at betterhelp.com slash trashy. Affordable option. It costs less than typical therapy options. Betterhelp.com slash trashy is your place to go for uh, reckoning out your mental health in 2020. Betterhelp.com slash trashy. It's a coupon. Alicia, I feel like you have the story of one of the real greats, one of the trashy divorces all stars, the one of the goats, the greatest of all times. One of the greatest of all times, friends and Stacy. <laughs> Where our trash candy brand is trash candy, Judy Garland's brand is most assuredly tragedy. Five marriages, four husbands, a series of chaotic and unhappy love affairs. And I would give a big intro here, but the story is, well, everything. Let's get into it. Judy's going to be born into the business. Her parents, Frank and Ethel, are vaudevillians who meet at a movie theater in Superior, Wisconsin in 1912. Ethel will play background music for silent films. Frank is a singer on the stage while the projectionist changes reels during movies. Their love affair is a little interrupted when Frank gets an out-of-town gig. He will end up working his way across 28 states. But by January 1914, Ethel and Frank, crazy kids, tie in the knot. Ethel is 20. Frank is 28. So they're going to join up. 
They're going to tour together for a while under the name of Jack and Virginia Lee. They will style themselves the Sweet Southern Singers. From Wisconsin? (laughs) It's a mad, mad world, Stacey. I don't know. The Sweet Southern Singers. All right. But Frank kind of gets that he and Ethel are never going to be big time. So the couple instead will take a gig running the New Grand, which is one of two theaters in Grand Rapids, Minnesota. Frank will also do some reporting part-time. Ethel will direct amateur musicals and join a jazz quartet. Could I... Are you sure it's Grand Rapids, Minnesota? Because there's a very well-known Grand Rapids in Michigan. Minnesota. Interesting. I mean, I'm sure there are waterways in both states. True that. Okay. Along the way, Frank and Ethel have some kids. Two girls, Mary Jane in 1915, and Virginia, who will insist as soon as she can talk, to be called Jimmy in 1917. What is with... This is like the fourth person on Trashy Divorces that insists on being called... Margaret Mitchell wanted to be Jimmy. I think Ava Gardner, too, wanted to be Jimmy. Well, and Jim and Tammy Baker were from somewhere up north and headed south to be preachers because they knew they needed to go to the south to get the right audience. Like Crazy. So All right, there's two kids, Echoes, the Mary Jane, and Jimmy. So Frank oh and Ethel are like, kids are over. They're broke. Two kids are plenty. So in 1921, when Ethel finds out she is pregnant, nobody's excited. Ethel tries to induce miscarriage Yikes. in every way she can conceive. None of them are successful. And on June 10th, 1922... Ethel will give birth to Francis Ethel Gum. Everyone will call her Babe. Frank and Ethel are going to realize that Babe is something special. When at the tender age of three, Babe's going to run out on stage and start to sing Jingle Bells over and over and over until her daddy Frank pulls her off the stage. Speaking of hams. Thanks, Cat. So after this, Ethel is like, hey, I have an idea. And she puts Mary Jane and Jimmy. Let's get this kid in front of a crowd. And baby all together, all the girls together in an act called the Gumdrops. Because their last name is Gum. I am shaking my head. That is not. mm -mm. Little Babe is the breakout star. Well. Judy will recall this period is the only time she saw her mom and dad happy. But in 1926, it's going to all come crumbling down when Frank will abruptly sell his half ownership of the Grand Rapid Theater and the whole family will relocate to Lancaster, California, a small desert town 45 miles north of L.A. Why the sudden move? Why the sudden move? Well, remember all that traveling Frank did 28 states before he got married? Mm -hmm. That had nothing to do with his successful career trajectory quote, but instead has a lot to do with the fact that Frank is run out of 28 states, all of them, it seems, for making sexual advances on high school boys. Whoa. And is this how they get run out of Minnesota as well? You got it. So when two ushers at the Grand Rapids Theater Mm. report that boss has uh, come on to them, the town elders of Mm, Grand Rapids, Minnesota, make it very clear Frank is no longer welcome. Bye-bye, Frank. So, like so many other families who flee to California during this time, Frank and the family will relocate. Frank will buy the only theater in the town of Lancaster, California. And soon, Little Babe is a star attraction. And Ethel can smell the dollars. I think Ethel may be in contention for the original momager here. She would eat Kris Jenner like a <laughs> cracker and a trisket, like a trisket on cheese, mm-hmm. a snack. She makes Chris Jenner look easy going. Sure. Okay. In 1967, Judy will tell Barbara Wawa, mm-hmm. Barbara Walters, my mother was truly a stage mother, a mean one. She was very jealous because she had absolutely no talent. She would sort of stand in the wings 
when I was a little girl, and if I didn't feel good, if I was sick to my tummy, she'd say, you get out and sing or I'll wrap you around the bedpost and break you off short. So I'd go out and sing. Yeah. Wow. And sing she does. Babe is comfortable on stage. So much that on stage is the only time she feels wanted. The stage is her friend. She feels alive and comfortable and safe. It's the time that she gets attention and recognition and any kind of validation in a tragedy. 1928, Babe is six. And Ethel has all the girls booked on a radio show. They're soon performing in L.A. and San Diego and Santa Barbara. And like a... Daily performing career is straining for adults. These are kids. But don't worry. Ethel has a plan. Any guesses what it is? Uh, meth? <laughs> ding, ding, ding. Drugs. Oh. Mm-hmm. Okay. Pet pills and sleeping pills. Hmm? Many sources say the pilling begins before Babe's 10th birthday. Some wildly good parenting there. Because adolescence isn't hard enough. Let's give them uppers and downers and see what happens. Well, the downers make sense once you've given them uppers. So where the fuck is Frank in all this? He... It sounds like he might be a little busy with his own shit. <laughs> well, sources are, sources are saying, like, he tries to slow Ethel down on this. But, oh, God, seriously, this set of parents. Ethel is a real piece of work. So when... Frank is like, you can't do this. Ethel will go to Babe's room with a suitcase and announce that they're leaving Daddy. <laughs> so threats of abandonment this, is going to completely be a mago in this story. This would be really different if um, she were a good mother who was not drugging her children. Um, no, she'll come in with a suitcase. We're leaving Daddy. Right. And Babe's like, I don't want to go. And Ethel's like, you don't love me. Oh, my God. So these threats of abandonment work. And every time Ethel feels like Babe is stepping out of line, Ethel will pack her suitcases, even if they're traveling, and they'll leave Babe behind in a hotel room, just waiting and wondering if her mom is going to come back. Like, this is cruelty on an unparalleled level, but wait on it. Because Ethel's a real sadist. She would always come back, but she would say, you're just lucky I came back at all this time, because next time I won't. Well... Let's draw up a Mother of the Year award to go put on her tombstone. Yeah. Naomi Judd, you, you're you now retired. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Ethel. Ethel Gum <laughs> is now taking your crown. Yeah. Naomi Judd, you're not a good mom, but... <laughs> <laughs> Ethel will continue to come back because she sees the fame that has eluded her. And she's putting all her hopes into, right, the new gum generation. Okay, so I feel like we're having some real gum dropping here. This is pretty bad. Yeah. Well, the gums will drop their name. They will have a suggested name change to Garland, which works a little better than gum. Mm -hmm. Seeming to pick up the... Babe Garland. Picking up the band. And after this, Babe, in the only act of defiance in her short life, decides that she would like a better name than Babe. So she's going to call herself Judy. Judy. After a Hoagie Carmichael and Sammy Lerner song about a girl named Judy who was fresh as spring. Judy is 11. Judy's 11. Club owners are trying to book her. She's getting invites from the Coconut Grove in Hollywood, like where the exclusive hangout of Hollywood. Let's think about how Mary Jane and Jimmy feel. Are they mad to be left out of the act? Nope. Totally cool with being phased out. Like, they're kids, too. And they've had yeah. mom's attention and weirdness for Decade a lot longer. Being weird at them, yeah. And they now see all of mom's ambition centered on the youngest and smallest kid. <laughs> Pressure's off. The sisters hear their salvation. Mm-hmm. Like, great. This is fantastic. Ethel's pushing Judy to all the studios. And will be noticed by Louis B. Mayer's right-hand lady. This gets Judy seen on a lower level with people. Judy's great. Judy gets an audition with big man Louie. At the age of 13, Judy is signed with MGM. You think we're going to have a happy turn in the story? 
Nope. I I watched Judy the movie, and I know we don't. Yeah, 47 days later, her dad Frank dies of spinal meningitis, mm. leaving $256 in cash and a stock certificate worth 150 bucks. Judy is now the family breadwinner. I bet Ethel really lightens up here, too. Judy will write that her dad dying leaves her to feel that no one is left on her side. But Judy's not alone. She's working for MGM, who at the time, this is 1935, is the biggest movie studio in the world. Its profits, MGM, will exceed the total of its seven combined competitors. It's a big deal. The studio is its own entire world. It has its own post office, fire department, bank dentist, police force, chiropractor, and schoolhouse. I'm air quoting around school and child labor laws. Oh, wait. No, it doesn't. Well, (laughs) you can be quarantined on the studio a lot forever. They'll just give you drugs to pick you up, take you down. You can still work. Sounds right. There are fixers there, right? To make sure your mistakes don't make it in the press and that your needs are attended to. But the trade-off for all of this is that the studio fucking owns you, man. Like what you do and how you do it. So remember Mickey Rooney? wanted to marry Ava Gardner and had to get permission from Louis B. Right. For Judy, she finds something almost comforting in this. Louis B. is going to be the closest thing to a father figure that she will have in the coming years. But don't worry, Ethel's still around. And MGM kindly puts her on the payroll too. Not to be a star, but to tend the star they have. Ethel's job is to make sure Judy does exactly what Judy is told to do. Yeah. Okay. That sucks. Judy will give her breakthrough performance singing, You Made Me Love You to a picture of Clark Gable. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. And the studio starts making demands. You know what that first demand is to a 13 year old girl? Is it lose weight? Oh, God, because I was thinking probably it was something gross like lose weight. Mickey Rooney later explains, of course, Judy was never fat or a little pig, even though Mr. Mayer insisted on calling Judy the fat kid and my little hunchback sometimes to her face. Trouble was, she bought the notion manufactured in Hollywood that good looks were of a certain ideal type like Lana Turner's for example I think she believed anyone who didn't conform to that type could either turn in her actress's license or get in line for character parts well it seems like she was getting such um I don't know healthy messaging from all of the adults around her at this point in her life Uh, let's talk about some more healthy adults the ladies in wardrobe Mm -hmm. will stand Judy next to plus size dummies and say, do you want to look like that or do you want to be a star? I... 13, 14 year old Judy, like this rocks her world. She's going to be a really healthy adult too. I'm like, banking on it. Banking on it. Like she's used to being seen for, seen for her talent, her mm-hmm. voice. Right. Nobody's ever said Judy's beautiful. Like she feels like that part of her is non existent. And she sees real beauties on the lot. Mm-hmm. Lana Turner, sure. for instance. And Judy begins at this time to feel like she cannot compete with any of that and will begin her hate-hate relationship with herself. Like, she looks in the mirror and hates what she sees all the time. So the public humiliation doesn't melt off pounds. So the studio will instead then starve her. They put her on a strict diet of black coffee and chicken soup. Judy would later say, From the time I was 13, there was a constant struggle between MGM and me. Whether to eat, how much to eat, what to eat. I remember this more vividly than anything else about my childhood. Mm. Again, this is the foundation for a healthy adulthood. It's so sad. Going to make good choices in relationships, going to make good choices with your body. I mean, what could go wrong? So Judy's deprivation Mm -hmm. will lead Judy to private binges. So she's sneaking food. Sneaking Mm -hmm. food. 
Who can which, blame her? Jeez. I'm fucking hungry. I've had coffee and chicken soup for three weeks and I'm on goddamn amphetamines. But wait, helpful momager Ethel will rat her out. Ethel's MGM's number one spy to report on sure. Judy when Judy falls out of line. She weighs one ounce more today. MGM is like, hey, maybe public shaming won't do it. Uh, let's get her on pills. And Ethel's like, hey, I thought you'd never ask. I love pills for so, kids. Yeah, we can get better pills than you, lady. I've, so, I've founded a nonprofit called Pills for Kids. <laughs> so MGM adds on to the dosing that Ethel is already doing to Judy. This is a nightmare. <clears throat> Even after Judy loses weight, she is still popping pills from the command of the studio and mom. Like, this is a way of life for studio kids. You knock them out, you let them sleep four hours, you dose them up, and they work 72 hours. This is the schedule that you're making seven times more than all your competitors. You got to keep cranking out the material. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sleep I'm just... four, work 72. No, this is just tragedy. Yeah. But Judy's working the same and making less than her male co-stars by like two thirds. Well, I don't know if you've read the U.S. soccer filing. <laughs> it's not a great system. It's a terrible system. For anyone, mm -hmm. especially women. Well, and this is a child. Yeah. Like, they're literally stealing this person's childhood. Mm -hmm. Also breaking her. Mm-hmm. In every imaginable way. Well, you say childhood. Judy's actually almost a legal adult by now. Even through The Wizard of Oz, no one wants to admit that she's almost 18. I'm she's... sure she didn't look it. They've been starving her and drugging her for years. Well, she's going to be made to look like a preteen. They'll flatten her breasts. They'll put her in a pinafore. And Wizard of Oz, when it comes out, isn't a big hit. It's not going to make its money back until the 1950s when it's aired on television. Hmm. But it is a big enough hit for MGM to want to continue to use Judy in this role of sexless child star. They take two years off her age, which will be a little problematic as Judy is a growing woman and in love. Not with hubby number one. He'll be the rebound. Here's the thing. We're going to see this pattern over and over. Judy's going to have her heart broken. By a man. And then marry someone else, not the person who broke her heart. So first round, round number one. Judy, young, 17, so young, has made the mistake of falling in love with band leader Artie Shaw, who has been married and divorced twice already. Artie has no idea, like, 28-year-old Artie has no idea that 17-year-old Judy is in love with him. She's like his little sister. They go out, the studio sets it up. It's a publicity photo, but he likes her well enough. They go out. Like, Artie's like, she's a good kid. But Artie Shaw has dozens of women hot and heavy all over him. Like, he's a big fucking deal. She's a child. Yeah, we're going to go out and take this picture with the studio. I'll hang out. But yeah, Judy's starved for attention. Let's go out for a malted. <laughs> Judy, in her teenage brain. And amphetamines. A malted and amphetamines. <laughs> That's a milkshake right there. So Judy is convinced that she is going to be wife number three. I mean, you can't blame her. She has no real dating experience. The studio <laughs> sets stars up with other stars. It's all very choreographed. She's on meth. <laughs> I'm just saying maybe it's not her fault, but, uh, you know, she may have thought a whole lot of things having basically been in the fantasy world of entertainment since she was three. <laughs> yeah. And on a routine of uppers and downers since the age of 10. And starvation. None of these things are good for you. Not a one. So, like, Judy doesn't have a lot of experience with this. She is convinced she's going to be Mrs. Artie Shaw number three. Like, even Judy had crushed on Mickey Rooney. A few years before, and he goes and up and marries Ava Gardner. Well, here's the double whammy, because Judy will pick up the paper one morning, and Artie Shaw has gone and done married 
Lana Turner hmm. at the end of their first date in Las Vegas. Yikes. Lana Turner, the most beautiful blonde in a sweater that ever oh, yeah. was. Like, yeah. you can imagine what this does for Judy's self-confidence. Mm. She's devastated. Broken up. Disconsolate. But the show goes on. And that week, she has a radio spot for a Bob Hope radio show that she will show up for. But she shows up and she is talking suicide. Like, she's super upset in the green room. And the other guests calm her down before the show begins. One of those is singer Margaret Whiting. The other is a dude named David Rose, hubby number one. Okay. David Rose is 30. Judy's 17. David Rose is also already unhappily married to singer and comedian Martha Ray. The fan magazines at the time comment that he seems older than his years, which is code for boring AF. He digs miniature railroads. He has a coal-burning steam engine and 800 feet of track at his home in the San Fernando Valley. When you say David Rose, though, all I can think of is Schitt's Creek oh. and the, the sun. Well, David. There you go. David <laughs> is also a Gemini. He's born June 15th, 1910. Born in London to parents that will shorten the family name from Rosenberg to Rose. Raised in Chicago, David's playing in bands by 16, breaks into radio, which will break him into leading his own orchestra and hosting this twice-weekly show called California Melodies for the Mutual Broadcast System, which is like the iHeart Radio of today. <laughs> Great. Okay, so we've got Schitt's Creek. We've got oh, iHeart Radio. Children on Meth. This is a very contemporary tale. So on Judy's 18th birthday, David is going to give her a ring. Ring, ring. ring no. Ring. Oh. A ring, ring. Oh. For her finger. Hmm. But the problem is he's not divorced. Right. And see, this would allow for an annulment. <laughs> he won't be divorced until March of 1941. The studio is furious. He is old. He's not good looking. All of this is wrong. These are the wrong optics. He, yeah, he's not actually single to, to become engaged. For our sexless child star. What the? No. Ethel agrees. Mama's like, nope, totally unsuitable. But Judy is going to what? Marry that boy. Going <laughs> to do what Judy wants to do for once in her goddamn life. <laughs> it makes her even more determined. Everybody's telling me, no, I'm right. 18. I can... I can do what I want. July 27th, 1941. Judy and Dave have a nice dinner at the Brown Derby and decide they're going to elope, which they do, to Las Vegas. And the studio is... I don't know. How do you Are think they, the studio feels? I bet, the, I bet they're thrilled. I bet they find out about it maybe from some, I don't know, <laughs> Johnny on the spot in Vegas and like send flowers and chocolates. Studio's pretty pissed about like it. Extra chocolates because they haven't actually fed her in years, so they have some budget for that. Pretty pissed about it. The couple is happy. The studio is furious. Yeah. But the couple is happy, at least in the beginning. They'll throw dinner parties. They both volunteer in the war effort. They're selling treasury bonds. David. David and Judy are entertaining the troops. But by April 1942, a scant nine months later, Luella Parsons takes a break from being godmother to Mia Farrow for a moment and reports that the couple has parted ways. Judy denies the rumor. Honestly, the studio is doing everything it can to pull them apart. Well, plus he needed to go start Rose Apothecary. <laughs> so. The studio's pissed and they're never going to forget or forgive her grievous sin of marrying David. David. So Judy and David are trying to hold it together, like me and you against the world and shit, until fall of 1942 when Judy gets pregnant. Hmm. The details are a little fuzzy. But what we can say is that Mama Ethel takes hubby David for a talk. Ethel will go back to Judy and say, David and I agree that you cannot have this child and the next day, David and Ethel 
take Judy for an abortion. I am feeling such deep heartache for this poor human being. It is the tr- most tragic story you've ever heard. The marriage will not recover after this. You think? I mean, I don't know. Weird. Judy will tell fellow MGM star June Allison the marriage was never the same. Something was gone. It broke my heart. I. It's hard to imagine it could be otherwise. David will announce their separation at the end of January 1943 after less than a year and a half of marriage. Yikes. Hubby number one. Out. Oof. Yeah. There will be a hubby number two. He's coming. <laughs> but first, what needs to happen? Tragedies are brand. Um, she needs to get her heart broken. Oh, I was thinking maybe she killed her mother with an axe because... Now, <laughs> that would be a much better story. Different story. I don't know about better. Fan fiction. Mm. <laughs> okay. No, she's got to get her heart broken first. Like, that has not been every single day of her life, but continue. So the first heartbreaker that's going to happen at this time is handsome movie star Tyrone Power, whose later history will reveal that he enjoys the company of men much more than the company of the ladies. But this one will break up because he is sent to war. Hmm. Okay. Then comes Joe Mankiewicz. Okay. 34 years old, married, two kids. And he's like the sexy professor of Hollywood. He will nurture Judy's talent. He will talk to her like an equal. Ladies in Hollywood... Ladies love LL Cool Joe. I'm not I, like <laughs> ladies find because he treats them the same. Like he is a master with the ladies. She's going to have a code name. Judy will call herself Miss Sherwood to get through on the switchboard for him. Interesting. Their love affair is a secret, but Judy begins saying that just like Artie Shaw, she's going to be the next Mrs. Mankiewicz. And Joe has absolutely no intention of leaving his wife he adores her but not like that there's a lot more dish coming on wednesday this week on patreon but needless to say this heartbreak will lead directly to hubby number two vincent minnelli i know that name vincent minnelli is born lester anthony minnelli in chicago february 28th 1903 pisces baby His paternal grandfather was a Sicilian revolutionary. His father is a conductor. His mother is an actress. His family once owns a tent show that travels around the Midwest. Similar to Judy, his showbiz parents tried to make him a star, but he's way more comfortable offstage. He graduates from high school at 16, moves to Chicago to attend the Art Institute, but will drop out to work. He becomes a photographer's assistant He's a window dresser at Marshall Field's department store and a costume designer for a stage show in Chicago before relocating to New York. Within three years, he's a designer at Radio City Music Hall. After that, he's working on Broadway. The world is his oyster. Well, there's this musical uber producer named Arthur Freed. And Arthur Freed sees Vincent and is like, hey, I got a sweet gig for you. Why don't you come to California and come to Hollywood? Come to MGM and uh, learn how to direct movies. I'm going to pay you to sit on the set and learn how to direct movies. Which he does. Eventually learning enough to get a chance to direct a movie, which he does. And that one's good. So he's going to get his next gig, a film called... Mimi and St. Louis. Judy on this film is starring, working her ass off. And when she sees the rushes of the film, she realizes that Vincent Minnelli has done what she feels is truly impossible. He has made her beautiful. Hmm. No conditions. She just looks great. She looks beautiful. The film's a blockbuster. Judy wants him directing her next film. She's gaining confidence from Vincent, and Judy is in love with his nurturing and recognition, and this guy is everything to her. They're dating. But what really will stun the world is their engagement announcement 
in January of 1945 because most of the world assumes that Vincent is gay. Judy will say this is his artistic flair. Hmm. There are indeed a lot of... I'm just... I'm not even gonna... Costume designer Irene Sheriff puts a finer point on it. She will say, Vincent saw something in Judy that nobody else ever did. I think he was truly in love with her, but I think that she was in love with the idea that somebody took her seriously. Louis B., all for this union, even though Vincent's almost twice Judy's age and not movie star handsome, he's considered a company man. And Judy's contract is set to expire in 1947, and she's already told Luella Uh. Parsons that she's going to leave MGM to go to Broadway. And Louis B. thinks that move is going to be harder to make if she is happily married to... An MGM director. Yeah, makes sense. Also, I hate Louis B. Mayer. I'm just... Like, he's been terrorizing her since she was a child. Yeah. And now he's just going to try to manipulate her for more money. We have a lot of follow-up on his skanky ass on Wednesday. He's pretty bad. So, since Judy had worked so well with Minnelli on the first two films, Louis B. figures that uh, he'd be great to prevent future bad behavior which was expensive and unprofessional. The couple will marry June of 1945, one week after the divorce to David Rose was finally finalized. David. (laughs) Louis B. Mayer will give the bride away (laughs) and spring for a three-month honeymoon in New York. Well, at least she got that. Minnelli will remember, these were our happiest times. The war was ending. It was a magical time to be in New York. Swept up in the excitement of the times, Judy throws her pills into the East River. A week before they return to L.A., Judy finds out that she is... Pregnant! You got it. This time, Ethel, MGM, and her husband support the pregnancy. And on Tuesday, March 12th, 1946, Judy gives birth to a daughter, Liza May Minnelli. This is a difficult birth. It's going to keep Judy bedridden for a month. When Judy finally does go out, she will collapse on the sidewalk. I was going to say, it's, let's again consider, this is a person who's been starved since she was a child. Probably hooked on amphetamines. Weird that her body might struggle with a pregnancy. When she collapses on the sidewalk, she's ordered back to bed, Mm -hmm. which is not made any easier by a severe case of postpartum depression. Oh, no. Wow. She just, wow, you're not kidding about tragedy as her brand. Louis B. gets what he wants because during this time, she will sign a new five-year contract with MGM, which she will later regret. And I've felt this feeling. You felt this feeling. Um, When she goes back to work, it is with tears in her eyes and resistance. Like, I've had that job where I've cried every day on the way to work because I do not want to do it. Things aren't going great at work. Home life with Vincent, not so great either. He will say that she's exhausting. Like, she seeks out constant approval. Who Who can even keep up with that? But come on, it's not hard to figure out why. Not at all. Like, you have a child punished with the threat of abandonment who would be an adult starved for reassurance and validation and, well, fucking starved. Like, you don't need Freud for that one. Oh, not at all. And it doesn't sound like there's really, perhaps with the exception of Vincent, there's no one in her life who sees her as a person. You Joe Mankiewicz saw her as a person. Okay. And that's... Well, it's right. Tra- so, it's, it's, all, it's tragedy. So, all yeah, she, tragedy. it sounds like she finds romantic partners who, in her mind, Validate see her as her. people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we've already had a baby. Things aren't going great at home. How do we fix it? This is like number three on Trashy Divorces Family Feud. Do we let's have an make affair? a movie together. Oh, let's make a movie together. Which is a disaster. Terrible idea. It's called The Pirate. Judy needs to drop the weight, so she's back on pills. So it is uh, zombie to zoomies. Zoomies to zombie. And she is growing more paranoid by the day. 
And Vincent, directing the movie, is working with the other star, who is Gene Kelly. And Judy is crazy jealous and feels like Vincent is not giving her enough of his time and you're not protecting me. And the film bombs and Judy will tell the studio that she will not be working with her husband again. And according to Vincent, she will pick back up her affair with Joe Mankiewicz. Oh, yeah. Problematic. No, hold on. Uh, unreliable narrator. Uh, okay. So what Minnelli doesn't mention was around that time that Judy started seeing Joe Mankiewicz again. Judy reportedly walks in on Vincent in their bed with another man. She responded by grabbing a razor and slashing her wrists. Oh, my God. She ends up in a psychiatric clinic, then another, but eventually is left in inpatient treatment because she misses her daughter, Liza. She will return to MGM. She'll make Easter Parade without incident. It was MGM's highest grossing movie of 1948 and Judy's biggest money maker ever. At the time, it's also considered a turning point in her career. The New York Herald Tribune will write that Miss Garland has matured to a remarkable degree. Her latest film performance is altogether her best. Story's turning around, right? Nope. Amid all the rave reviews was an ominous observation by the New York Daily News. Judy, wan and frail, needs a little more flesh on her bones to give her more verve and bring her up to the to her old standard as an entertainer. Hmm. Well, so now she's being skinny shamed. <clears throat> Judy's after, back on the pills. After she's, a lifetime of being yeah, like weirdly fat shamed cuz anyway, she was a child. Movie star skinny but also a case of nervous exhaustion. So thus begins the cycle of Judy starting a movie, dropping out to seek treatment. After a few months, she'd return to the studio healthy, ready to work. And then they'd tell her what? Lose weight. Here's some pills. Right. Uh, so she's working. Right. But out. And sometimes working, but sometimes replaced in films. Right. Because she, she gets a reputation as being unreliable. It's so. a bad cycle. Yeah. It's a bad cycle, and I don't think it's her fault. Like, it's a bad cycle. Meanwhile. I do feel like probably by this point in her life, though, the patterns are so deeply ingrained. It, I The journey out of that, I don't even know if... Plus, what she does for a living, I think by this point, she must hate... But it like, what do you do? Can Judy Garland go and wait tables? Like, Depends on how heavy she is. <laughs> I don't know. It's just, it's all. It's just a story's tragedy. It's it's really it's rough. Second marriage, according to Minnelli, in his words, had become a treadmill to disaster. They separate in the spring of 1949, while Judy is filming Annie Get Your Gun. What? Judy Garland wasn't in that. No, she wasn't. She was recast. Got replaced, mm -hmm. yeah. She begs to be reinstated. No luck. Louis B. Mayer feels like he owes her something. So Louis B. convinces the studio to pay for Judy to be treated by his personal physician. He removes her from all of her Hollywood Dr. Feelgoods, relocates her to a hospital in Boston. What happens? She flourishes. I was going to say, this sounds like a very good start. She comes back to work. No. Nope. What happens? My God. The cycle begins again. Let the woman stay in Boston. Maybe she can meet a rich man and <laughs> start a museum in a weird house she built. I don't know. The film Summer Stock is made uh, with the killer dance number that Judy's brought back for of Get Happy. It's a Amazing. This dance routine number of Get Happy that will be in Summerstock is the last thing she will film at MGM. Judy kills it. Her contract is dropped. We're going to talk more about this on Wednesday on Patreon. 1951, divorce proceedings are underway with Minnelli. But that doesn't mean that she isn't already dating hubby number three, Sid Luft. Well, Sid... Is born in New York City on November the 2nd. He's a Scorpio baby. 1915. 
He grows up Jewish in the waspy enclave of Westchester County. His dad owns a jewelry store. His mother runs dress shops. Similar to Artie Shaw, he will experience anti-Semitism as a kid. Sid loved boxes. That's his way out. And he gets the nickname One Punch Luft. After high school, he will end up dating tap dancing phenom and MGM star Eleanor Powell, who will hire him as her personal secretary. But Sid Luft will say, oh, 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 tut, tut, I was her manager. Whatever. Whether or not Sid was overstating his position, he leaves showbiz for aviation in 1941. This same year, he will divorce his first wife. He will move north, join the Royal Canadian Air Force. Oh, very north. Mm -hmm. Before the U.S. enters the war, after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, Sid Luft will return to America and become a test pilot for Douglas Aircraft, where he works until he's severely burned in a I crash. Was, <laughs> hmm, that, see, I was about to say, a lot of those guys did not make it. <laughs> Test pilot tended to have a short yeah. short duration. Sid's still mm -hmm. around. In 1943, Sid is going to marry a B-movie actress named Lynn Barry. Together they have a son. He tries to break back into the business and manages two low-budget movies for like a Poverty Row studio, but that's about it. Sid is hoping to put together a biopic of champion racehorse Man o' War when he runs into Judy. At a nightclub. All I, all I can think is Bojack Horseman, but go ahead. That's how you get ants. <laughs> in New York in 1950. Okay. <sighs> but see, the first time they meet in 1950 mm -hmm. in New York is not the first time they've met. Okay. They met back when Judy was 15. Okay. Years and years ago. And Judy thinks he's a, like a conceited ass. And he thinks she's a shrimp. Those are his It sounds words. like they're both right. I mean. So they reconnect. Sure. They will continue to see each other in Los Angeles. Even though Judy's still married, she is crazy about Sid Luft. Nothing sways her off of him. Even the fact that his ex-wife comes to her and tells her the things. Okay, court documents no. uh, reveal that wife one divorces him, claiming she's the sole breadwinner. Sid blew all of their money on the ponies in uh, second divorce proceedings. Uh, second wife alleges that Sid would leave the house in the evening to get a newspaper and be back at 6 a.m. Wife warns Judy about Sid. Judy blows her off. She says, you're bitter. You see everything in a distorted light. He's a <laughs> wonderful guy. I'm Judy Garland. I have clarity. I've grown to know him better than anyone else has. And you're wrong about the man you married. Because the man I'm in love with is fantastic. I've been an addict since I was eight. I know the truth. This is how far gone Judy is. An incident that should have been a field full of red flags. Okay. Instead of being a red flag... Seem to be further proof that he's the one for her. In October 1951, Sid runs through a stop sign, broadsides a car, which slams into a third car. Sid and Judy both had been drinking, and the situation is under control until Judy smacks one of the other drivers and breaks his glasses. But, okay, at any point when they were out on their drunk driving escapade there, did they pull out firearms and start shooting into empty buildings because... No, Judy just hits Harry Potter. Okay. And once she hits Harry Potter... Breaks his wand. Then this dentist drives up uh -oh. in this other car. And he's like, I saw the whole thing. And Sid is at fault, which at this point... As a Sid driver, yeah. Punches the dentist in the oh, face. Oh, boy. Breaks his nose and his glasses. So a little brawl to bond over... Three smashed cars, two pairs of broken glasses. The cops search Sid's car and find a uh, handgun Sid no. had stolen from Douglas Stole. Aircraft back in the day. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> what is with people at the time? Hey, I know. Let's get drunk and drive around and shoot shit. You busy? <laughs> It's due to about nine o'clock. 
I got an idea. David. <laughs> okay. So some girls would be like, yo, yo, this is bad. This maybe isn't the guy for me. But not Judy Garland. Not Judy. Uh, the cops, she's like, this is no big whoop. And the cops apparently agree with her. Sid gets off with a $150 fine for drunk driving. No jail time. Her biographer will explain what was clear was that in Sid, who had a boxer's biceps and a bulky build, she had discovered a man who would quite literally fight for her. Yeah. So Sid is going to take credit for resurrecting Judy's stage career. Judy's like been dumped from him. MGM, but mm-hmm. she's already fielding offers. Like, there's no dumping my career. I'm fucking Judy Garland. Did you get the memo? But Sid comes in, fucks it all up. She will accept a gig at London's Palladium Theater, $70,000 for a four week run. It's about $700,000 in today's money. All of her friends at MGM, as well as hubby number two, Vincent Minnelli. Help her put together an act featuring songs that she's made famous in the movies. She opens with You Made Me Love You. She'll close with Somewhere Over the Rainbow. Show sells out. It's a smash. Once Sid and Judy return to the States, Sid steps up, puts together a deal for Judy to resurrect vaudeville at the famous Palace Theater in New York City. This is a theater her parents dream of playing that Frank abandons his idea of stardom for because they're never going to make it to the Palace Theater. Wow, what a thing for her. Wow. In words of one reviewer, opening night was Bedlam superimposed on Bedlam. Was uh, Ethel still alive at this point? Probably. I I don't know when Ethel dies. It must have been, assuming Ethel was still alive, it must have been on some level. Quite satisfying to tell mom about your upcoming show. I think the thing Judy found satisfying was that first night she got a standing ovation that clocked in at three minutes and 18 seconds. Of her success, Judy will say, it was like breathing again, having people let me know I still meant something to them, that they love me and wanted me to sing. Sid and Judy take the show on the road, June 8th, 1952, two days before her 30th birthday, Sid and Judy get hitched at a friend's ranch in California. The only two people that are happy about the marriage are Sid and Judy. Motion Picture Magazine will write, if Judy had a dollar for every friend who whispered in her ear that Sid was a far from ideal matrimonial bet, she'd have a hefty bankroll to show. <laughs> this is Motion Picture Magazine who writes this. Be- like, don't do it. Fake news. Don't do it. Okay. okay but so th- she did it. But she does. I'm going to marry that boy. The details of Sid and Judy's marriage are difficult to pin down. The Luffs will spend a lot of time on the road. Sid was almost universally disliked by everyone in Judy's social circle. So the couple becomes what? More and more isolated. Isolated, yeah. Mm -hmm. A little codependent, a little, yeah. Which will leave Sid who doesn't always come off as reliable narrator man. Even when he admits to behaving badly, like you still get the sense he's holding back and minimizing his culpability in the tragedy. What we do know is by 1952, Sid had assumed control over Judy's finances and wasn't shy about spending her money Hmm. on... Ponies? Sid. Uh Uh-huh. Okay. He will buy himself a bespoke wardrobe from London's Savile Row. He'll throw a lot of cash around on the ponies. He will also short the casting crew of Judy's stage show. Great. One of his exes will sue him for child support payments, pointing out that uh, old Sid had spent twice as much on 
three racehorses he owned as he had his own son. Well, I mean, the horse probably had a lot of needs. <laughs> Warner Brothers Studio shoes. Chief. So many shoes. Nike horseshoes. Have probably. you seen the shoes for those three horses? I mean, that's a performance horse. <laughs> Warner Brothers Studio Chief Jack Warner says about Sid, he's one of the original guys who promised his parents he'd never work a day in his life and made good. Judy knows the score, right? She says to her friend Dorothy, who's a makeup artist and one of the employees that's the Sid, Sid screwed stiffed over. back in London. Yeah. I know what's going on, but I love the guy. The heart I mean, wants what the heart wants. Yeah. And I mean, really, the life that you've described, if you find someone who is marginally loyal to you and not to Louis B. Mayer yeah, or whatever. Her... <sighs> Judy will credit Sid with saving her career and getting her back into the movies. In 1952, the same year, Judy gives birth to their first child, a daughter named Lorna. Sid will strike a sweetheart deal with Jack Warner. So the Luffs will form a production company which will produce pictures and Warner Brothers will pay for them. The studio will provide the money, the facilities, the technicians. If the film is make money, Warner Brothers will split the profits with Sid and Judy. If they lost money, the studio will take the hit. Right. Seems like a good plan, right? I mean, if you're them, yeah. Let me guess, though. It turns out that Judy's inability to get a job done comes back to haunt them. Their first production is a little film called A Star is Born. Oh, I've heard of it. Judy is suffering from severe postpartum, postpartum. depression again, okay. plagued by problems. The, f- uh, the film has problems. So when they start, they shoot half the film, and then Warner Brothers decides they want to reshoot it in CinemaScope. With Gaga and Bradley Cooper? That's exactly right. Cool. So they can fall in love. It, it's awesome. They're not dating. Sure. <laughs> okay. So they have to go back in on this film and reshoot everything they've done. Everything's off the rails. The editing job is a bloodbath. Like, it really is. Film critics will say the movie was great before they edited it. Um, But they do edit it. No matter, the film is hailed as a triumph. Judy is nominated for an Academy Award. But at the time, she's giving birth to child number three, a son named Joseph. Not Sid. Mankiewicz? I don't know. Hmm. Joseph, just interesting there. Can I interject that, Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of um, the more current Star is Born with Gaga and Cooper... Renee Zellweger dated Cooper for a couple of years there. It's like trash candy spider I webs all I up didn't, in this joint I didn't even today. realize that one. Huh. So Judy's in the hospital because mm. she gave birth to the Joseph. day before to Joseph, the day before the Oscars. So NBC, not wanting to miss their shot of a near guaranteed win, will set up a tower. Outside her hospital hotel room. Nope. So they can film her reaction nope. to the wind so it can be captured. Nope. HIPAA violation. Which does not happen. She doesn't win. Grace Kelly, future princess of Monaco, will win that year for the country girl, her best Oscar. She was Grace Kelly was nominated before for Best Supporting Actress in Magambo, starring Ava Gardner. Spider webs. So what happens? Judy doesn't win. The tower. The, meanwhile, packs down. yeah, there's a camera. There's a tower. Oh God, people just window. leave, and Judy is like, that feeling was worse than not winning. Yeah. Was everybody just packed up their shit and went home? A Star Is Born will be the first and last movie Judy makes under contract with Warner Brothers. By 1955, Sid and Judy are broke. They dip their paws into television for a minute, which will replenish their coffers. But Sid, I like the ponies left. It's going to blow through that cash soon enough. Judy will initiate divorce proceedings several times. But in 1965, she'll finally follow through. Sid and Judy's divorce finalized in 65. 
There's a bitter custody fight. Judy will say it's over. It lasted 11 years and it would take 11 years to tell you what went wrong. Hubby number three, out of there. Luft. Luft is loose. <laughs> Luft is gone. Luft has left. But Judy's heart will, of course, be broken again. Mm, yay. Bef- this time by her business managers. Again, Patreon, Ocean's Eleven Wednesday. We got to get to hubby number four. On New Year's Eve, 1963, Judy will meet hubby number four at a party hosted by the costume designer for her TV show. This dude's name is Mark Heron. He has been described as a bisexual con artist. <laughs> he physically abuses Judy. Wow. Okay, didn't mean to laugh there. His other profession is acting, but at the high point of his career, he was named 1952's Actor of the Year for the L.A. City College Drama Department. Okay. Hasn't done anything in 12, like... I was going to say, this is way after 1952. Okay. After graduation, Mark will study with Oscar-winning actor Charles Lawton. In 56, Lawton takes Mark Heron back east for a Broadway revival of Major Barbara. Heron is fired from the production. Three weeks before the Boston tryout, his career never recovers. He cannot get work in the States. He moves to Italy. He will land a small role in Federico Fellini's Eight and a Half, but he mostly supports himself dubbing Italian films into English. So Mark meets Judy, New Year's Eve. Up until this point, he'd been involved with a much older German-born character actor named Henry Brandon for several years. But he will promptly dump Are Henry you're Brandon. Looking at me for a response, like, I mean, I think Judy Garland probably has more money. Maybe, potentially. He's going to dump Henry and hit the road with Judy, who makes him a producer of a series of shows. That she'll play at London's Palladium with her daughter, Liza. Hmm. Details of this marriage are sketchy. According to the LA Times, reports of Heron's marriage to Garland were alternately denied and confirmed in the summer of 1964. Garland's manager, Freddie Fields, scoffed at the reports of the marriage, pointing out that the actress was not yet divorced from Sid Luft. But Garland said the next day, that the marriage to her longtime traveling companion was absolutely legitimate. The couple finally did make it official at a small chapel in Las Vegas in November 1965. 17 months later, I was going to say this couldn't have lasted very long. Judy will be granted a divorce after testifying that Mark Heron had beaten her. Yikes. He will say he only hit her in self-defense. Judy will divorce Mark. What does Mark do? Gets back together with his boyfriend, Henry. Oh, good Henry, for Henry. Henry and Mark will remain together until Henry's death in 1990. Good on you, Henry. I Nice of you to take him back. I and hope he wasn't violent with you. In 1969, Judy will marry for the fifth and final time. This guy, his name is Mickey Deans. He's born Mickey DeVinco in Garfield, New Jersey, September 24th, 1934. So he's considerably younger than she is. Is that right? Oh, yeah. Okay. He'd been intermittently an employed jazz pianist and singer who was working as the night manager of a Manhattan disco called Arthur. In the recent Judy biopic, mm-hmm. the couple meet cute at a party. But according to Mickey, he and Judy met when a mutual friend asked him to dress up like a doctor and deliver a package of amphetamines to her at her hotel room in the St. Regis. You say tomato. I I say I have a package of amphetamines. I mean, whatever. Judy's 44. Mickey's 34. Okay. Over the next few months... Mickey will ingratiate himself becoming indispensable. Biographer Gerald Clark will describe him as Mr. Fix-It. There's no problem. He could not effortlessly solve or find someone who could. Broken TV, stalled car, dispute with a landlord. Mickey's got you. 
The progression of their relationship was goosed by Judy's travel plans. So Judy tells Mickey that she has to go to England for a gig. He will propose. She accepts. They marry in London at the Chelsea Register's office on the Ides of March, 1969. Yikes. Ominous, right? A very. After they I, I think the, the I think the movie maybe makes it seem like there was a little more time together. After they tie the knot, Judy will tell reporters, bless her little self, this is it. For the first time in my life, I'm really happy. Finally, I am loved. Judy's family and friends do not share her joy. The couple will invite several hundred people to their reception. Fifty show up. Lorna Luft says that when her sister Liza Minnelli heard their mother was getting married again, she begged off saying, I can't make it, Mama, but I promise I'll come to your next one. Oh, God. I mean, like, on the one hand, I completely understand. It's so sad. Well, yeah. Yes, it's sad because... We did a Stonewall story for Patreon over the summer um, that included that Judy Garland's funeral was held the day that the Stonewall riots began. Three months later, after the marriage, Mickey will find Judy dead in their bathroom at the age of 47 years old. I think old. was also the year that the uh, age that Frida Kahlo died. Mm hmm. The coroner determines the cause of death was barbiturate poisoning due to incautious self-overdosage. The circumstances of her death are quite clearly accidental. Judy's body is flown from London to New York, where she is laid out at Frank E. Campbell's funeral home on the Upper East Side. An estimated 22,000 people pay their respects, and as you just mentioned, gay people have their trashy divorce from the establishment that particular night at the Stonewall Riots in 1969. Mm -hmm. Three years after Judy's death, Mickey will publish a tell-all book about his relationship with Judy called Weep No More, My Lady. In 1985, Mickey will buy a castle in Cleveland, Ohio, not a typo, where he lived until 1999. He dies of a heart attack in 2003. At the age of 68, he never remarries. Mark Heron, other hubby, after being with Henry until Henry's death in 1990, Mark Heron will die in 1996 at the age of 67 years old. Sid Luft will marry twice more. He died of a heart attack on September 15, 2005 at the age of 89. His memoir, Judy and I, My Life with Judy Garland, was posthumously published mm -hmm. in 2018. Vincent Minnelli will go on to marry three more times and have another daughter. He will direct An American in Paris, The Bandwagon, Brigadoon, Bells Are Ringing, and the Elizabeth Taylor comedy, Father of the Bride, as well as the Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin drama, Some Came Running, and Gigi, for which he won an Oscar. Vincent Minnelli will die of pneumonia July 25th, 1986, at the age of 83. Mm. David Rose, going all the way back to number one. David. <laughs> will marry just once more, has two daughters. He will work extensively in TV and had at least two million selling records. He dies of a heart attack on August 23rd, 1990, at the age of 80. Towards the end of Judy's life, a reporter will ask Judy if she ever got tired of singing her most famous sad song. Fuck, I wasn't going to cry. Somewhere over the rainbow. Judy says, am I tired of singing over the rainbow? Listen, it's like getting tired of breathing. I will say if you had watched the movie with me, this moment would be going no better. It's... They they build it really well in the film. <sighs> I don't mean that. The whole premise of the song is a question, a quest. At the end, it isn't, 
Well, I found my world and I'm a success and you and I will be together. The lyric is having little bluebirds fly over the rainbow. Why, oh, why can't I? It represents everyone's wondering why things can't be a little better. I told you there would be no tears when we started this. I really you, thought yeah, I was Yeah, you good. did. You did tell me that. After Judy dies, Mickey Rooney says she was, I'm sure, at peace and has found that rainbow. At least I hope she has. I'm giving all the trash cans on this one to everyone who used and abused this poor child and woman. Ethel, you get oh yeah, thousands. No, it's weird. Husbands, like, all of you. Studios, galaxies full of trash cans. No, it is like Ethel's dumb luck that this didn't turn into a true crime story. Because that child must have been filled with rage. Ethel, all of her husbands, all of them. Palladiums, <laughs> studios full of trash cans. Judy will get all the halos for just wanting us to get happy. Why can't things be a little better? I, Judy Garland. So much more of Judy's story is coming on Wednesday in our continuing Ocean's Eleven series. Mm -hmm. Again, thank you, Melanie Z. Uh, did a great job in her research for this. This is half the story. I have the other half waiting for you on Wednesday. And don't forget, <sighs> many of us might have a little bit more time to listen to podcasts in the coming weeks. And we're going to be dropping a hot bonus episode for you on Tuesday. So be sure to subscribe now so you won't miss that. And we may even have some more lucky surprises for you. Yeah, we, that particular day. We do. We will. If you're not subscribed, you want to be subscribed because yeah. we got hot news. Yeah. <sighs> that wraps another week of trashy divorces over the rainbow style. I, so no, just you're... like people request Renee Zellweger and Kenny Chesney and we're mm -hmm. like, yeah, it's a mystery. Yeah. People request Judy Garland no, and I I'm know. like, it's yeah. so long. Yeah. It's a tragedy. It's, yeah. It's a tragedy. It's hard to make a comedy podcast about divorces when it's this tragic, but Judy Garland, mm -hmm. fucking trashy divorces all star. Sure. Hell of a broad. Hell of a broad. Yeah. Trying to think of whether Louis B. Mayer improved the lives of anyone in his orbit i'm sure he did oh we're gonna talk about that jackass on wednesday <clears throat> i got you i got you covered bring yeah. your questions all right so should we perhaps wrap things up Our for the listeners week listeners really need to go to the bathroom <laughs> the heart wants and the bladder wants what it needs <laughs> you can take your phone with you to the bathroom people just you know Hit it with an alcohol wipe after. Wash your hands. Wash your hands. Hey, thanks everybody for tuning in. Don't forget, we got a fun little uh, St. Patrick's Day surprise that you're never going to see coming. Coming for you on Tuesday. It's leprechauns. I'm going to be wearing green. I may even dye wine green or something. It's leprechauns. We're just going to put leprechauns out Ooh, on your feed. Can I put some green dye into the sourdough bread and we have green bread? Probably. Ooh. Now St. Patrick's Day and, and unless, quarantine is getting interesting. Unless people have panic bought all the food coloring. Can't imagine there's a rush on food coloring, I mean, but I don't know. What do I know? Until then. I didn't know people were gonna need toilet paper for a respiratory illness, but here we are. Yeah, if you need twenty four rolls of toilet paper for three days, you got a bigger problem <laughs> than COVID nineteen. I'm just saying. <laughs> Oh, friends, thanks everybody for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed this extended episode of Trashy Divorces. Y'all are the very best. We like you. We like you a lot. Mm -hmm. Wash your hands. Stick around. You're awesome. We can't wait to talk to you on Tuesday. Until then, keep what do we want the people to do? We want them to keep it trashy. We want you to wash your hands. Sure. And keep it trashy. We want you to be hygienic and trashy. The two of those can coexist we, at the same time. We think so. I mean, we cannot end an episode worth a damn, but the two of those can coexist. Wipe down your doorknobs. <laughs> keep it trashy, friends. Thanks for tuning in. Y'all are the very best. Bye. See you Tuesday.
Oh, tacos. What? Yeah. Keep it Trashy Taco Tuesday. All right, sourdough. All right, Faraday. Trashy Divorces Quarantine Headquarters. Out. Out. Trash Pandas, thanks for listening. Trashy Divorces is written and produced by us, Stacy and Alicia, for Hemlock Creatives. You can contact us at trashydivorces at gmail.com. Our art is by Sydney V. Smith, Sydney V. Smith at carbonmade.com. And our music is used with permission of Ratsy. You can find her at Ratsy's store on Instagram. Big thanks to our season five associate producer, Melanie Z. Check out episode sources, photos, soundtracks, merch store, and more at trashydivorces.com. Need more trash candy? Our Patreon community includes some of the bestest humans around, as well as a bunch of bonus content every week. Join the fun at patreon.com slash trashy divorces. Last but not least, come play with us on social. We are at trashy divorces at Instagram, which Alicia mostly runs. Twitter, which Stacy mostly runs. And on Facebook, which, which we, we split. split. We also have a trashy divorces discussion group on Facebook. If you want to chat with other trashy divorces listeners. Thanks again for listening. Keep, Keep it, it trashy, trashy y'all.